there's no one on the internet can stop you from consuming said plot. I, I, I can stop you. You could try. <laughs> welcome welcome everyone to shoot around podcast my name is richard my name is Austin, awesome. and we're at episode 60 my god it's been a while that's a lot <laughs> it's a lot of episodes that's a lot today we're actually talking about gatekeeping in more specifics gatekeeping in different fandoms so we'll be going over booktube and also other different tv shows and fantasy and all that stuff yeah and you could tell by the title it's a little clickbaity baity but we're gonna deliver of course on that clickbait because <laughs> richard came the other day i was like hey austin Gatekeeping's good. And I went, what? That's a great <laughs> title for a video, Rich. That's a great title for a podcast. And so he brought this up to me, and he actually had something nuanced and interesting to say, and I was so shocked mm. because this is the first time I'd ever heard Richard put sentences together in a somewhat coherent way. And I said, Richard, you got to you gotta make this our next podcast thing. So he's going to take a lot of the mantle for this because Rich has some really interesting things to say on this. I have more questions to delve at you, and we'll we'll get into all those, but we're going to talk about what's the gatekeeping we're talking about. There's a lot of booktubers that are much bigger than us who have said things that we agree with, but also I think they're missing, and more so Richard brought this up, so I'm going to, uh, well, I'm giving you your credit. Just stop looking at me okay. like that. So <laughs> Richard, Richard has something to say, which a lot of the book community and fandoms seem to be ignoring one vital reason of why there are gatekeepers. And yeah. I'll ask you more questions on that. And finally, we'll get into like why, why you think it's good. So I, I, to, there's a lot we're going to talk about. I think it's very interesting. And I want to start off with what is the gatekeeping that we're talking about here? Well, let's make that sure. clear. Yeah. Generally, what people mean by gatekeeping is a member of a fandom telling someone who is new to it that, oh, they're not a real fan or basically putting qualifiers on to be a fan of X, you have to like why or you have to know this uh, the right. standard one would be oh you're a you're a fan of iron maiden name their last three albums you like to ramble name episode 12 <laughs> if anyone I does name episode 12 i i'm we don't even have fans we have people that tolerate us occasionally <laughs> on a monday that are just like all right hey we are great morning commute podcast <laughs> We, we fit that niche. I like to think our followers have jobs and are uplifting citizens. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's the, the kind of gatekeeping you, you talk about here. Go on. Go on. Yeah. That. But a lot of that, I would say, is more like the bad type of gatekeeping that people want to avoid would be kind of walling off your fandom. And someone who's new, who doesn't know a lot, but is interested and wants to know more, you should totally accept them just because they don't know everything about some particular interest group doesn't mean they should be excluded. They, you should want to welcome in new people. However, a gate typically implies that some people kept out, some people are let in. The people that should be kept out are the people that may say they're a fan, but ultimately want to, they don't like any of the aspects that make the fandom what it is, or they want to change everything. For example, Austin here, you're not the biggest fan of Hyperion. You're, you think it's okay. <gasps> but if you came into the Hyperion fandom or you started getting on Reddit or starting groups where an adaptation is starting and you said, oh yeah, I'm a fan of Hyperion, but oh, they should take out this person's storyline. They should change this up. Oh, they should change this character. And they should, be if you started wanting to change everything about it, someone would, I think, be right to gatekeep you out go like are you really even a fan though you just want to change everything someone, why would, if you're a fan of something why would you want to change all those things fundamentally exactly because i i have some questions for you off of this mm -hmm. but to expand upon an analogy it's like a a westeros a game of thrones fan saying i don't like all these gray characters let's make them good and evil or someone going into yeah. Lord of the Rings saying, let's add some morally gray to all these let's make sauron have a good side stuff like that that fundamentally changed yeah. the nature of what what that fandom is right yeah i would say for the most part gatekeeping is far more important not on the individual level but it's actually important on the corporate level so okay. in, when a corporation comes in to make an adaptation that is when gatekeeping should actually be happening if it's just some person on the internet that's like "Ooh, i like this thing and people are being mean to them because they don't know enough 
yeah, you're being a dick. Got it. So, and gatekeeping to, to make this clear as well, there's the two different definitions. When I looked up online, just the Oxford definition of gatekeeping is the activity of controlling and usually limiting general access to something. Not what you're talking about, right? No, and it's kind of impossible to do that now in the you know day of the internet. There's no one on the internet can stop you from consuming said product. I, I, I can stop you. You could try. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you want me to know, like, that's, that is impossible. Like, I, I totally agree. If you can't just say, I think I moved. Yeah, the chair's so off for the shot now. <laughs> All right, now we're in shot. I had, to, I had to move the chair back. That would have annoyed me during editing. <laughs> so the, uh, the gatekeeping we're not, you're not talking about here is literally stopping someone from the fandom. You can't yeah. have, it's not a wall. You can't just stop someone from entering you're talking about the more urban dictionary version of this, what you generally see booktubers talking about, which we're gonna we're gonna actually attack some booktubers today. We're gonna Oh yeah. We're attacking in the internet yeah. term of disagreeing with someone on the internet. By attacking I mean we're gonna agree with everything they say and add one thing that they're missing. <laughs> so that's yeah, pretty for much the most part. So the urban dictionary def- dictionary definition is more so when someone takes it upon themselves to decide who's in a group and who's out. That's what yeah. you're talking about. It's like, hey, can you call yourself a fan of this? And you already pointed out, it's not to say, oh, you can't name three, you can't name the children of Vigo Mortensen. You can't name his yeah. son, Henry, I think is his son's name. I'm a true fan. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying, right? And yeah. then, th- then my question for you is this. Before mm-hmm. we get into reacting to these videos and more of why it's a good thing, there's, some, there's a couple reasons why it's good to gatekeep from my understanding. We had a brief conversation. How how do you determine how do you determine that arbitrary line of when you become a fan or not? How is that decided? Man, that is honestly the the hardest, most nuanced part of the conversation. Is typically, I think it's you're a fan when you want to you want things to say more the same than you want things to change. Okay, and that's your and, definition, though. Yeah, it, it honestly it comes down to the individual. It's really hard. If if it was easy, then it would wouldn't be a contentious topic it it wouldn't be super hard to deal with it but sometimes there are people that want things change and want things to change but they're actually are a fan because they like the fundamentals but then sometimes it's really easy i think you brought up with like if someone was saying oh yeah i don't like how sauron is um i don't like how sauron is just evil evil character In the next show, they should make him really morally gray, maybe even an anti-hero. At that point, they're not a fan. They don't like what is fundamental about it. Or they maybe they want to do a fan fiction, but that's not the... Ultimately, you've strayed so far away that you're no you're it's longer a, different a thing. fan. It's a different thing. And maybe you're a fan of that different <sighs> thing, but you're not a fan of the original thing. Got it. So when when it comes to this, these lines, it's so arbitrary. But you yeah. can. There's an extreme. There's someone between. There's there's an extreme between someone who wants to change Sauron fundamentally or change the fundamental nature, and someone who has an interesting theory on something. Or because, oh, I think the actor uh, should. I I don't think Viggo Mort should be Aragorn. It should be this character. Like it's fine. Im- it's important whatever. not to shut out opinion, but. There is a line somewhere where it's, hey, you are, this is not the point of this. Of, if you like this thing, you, it's just not for you. Mm-hmm. It, so then my next question is, who draws that line? Because is it you, Richard, the almighty I, I <laughs> gatekeep my fandom? Or is it the fandom in general? What if the fandom disagrees with the fundamental part of the that's, fandom? That's the wonderful thing. It's more of, it's like an organism a fandom is a community is like an organism they ultimately kind of have to come to a decision together and it's no there's no formal vote for democracy it just kind of is okay typically you'll see when a fandom is fandoms can be divided of course on their difference uh, on their differences but ultimately they'll have something in common and you can typically see it with franchises that have not had an adaptation for a while so meaning they're going off of the old steam. Like they're they're surviving off of their own and there's no new content. So there's no new fans going along. So I would say like Star Trek went a, a good stretch of years before there was any new movie, new television show, anything. That that fandom was pretty I would say that is the original fandom. There's been no influx of fans that are on some new project. It's all the old stuff. 
And then when they came out with the brand new movies, you have an influx of fans that are fans of those movies, not the originals. Okay. That would then I would think that'd be a dividing point of the older fans and the new fans of the new stuff. That would be where things start dividing. Right, like the Lord of the Rings, you know, the the trilogy, and then Rings of Power. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in this <laughs> we'll, podcast. We'll get, into we'll, that. we'll get into that. <laughs> but I, I think a really good point that this and you made a good point there seriously. And then there, there's another good point that this redditor made mm-hmm. that goes off of what you're saying there of calling yourself a fan or not is important because here I'll put this on screen here but it's as if talking to a bodybuilder and someone who it's their second day at the gym and they bench 100 pounds calling themselves a bodybuilder it's not you saying hey I, you would encourage that person keep coming to the gym like please like that's it's good for you and like we want you to be a part of the culture here and get into good shape it's a great community and whatnot but you can't say you're a marathon runner if you just ran a 5k you can't say you're a bodybuilder if you just started at the gym, like you're getting into it. And this is where it comes into why you say it's important for corporations to gatekeep corporations, because would you want the director of your new movie being someone who hasn't read the books or maybe watched one thing or doesn't really care about it? Like someone who's directing a documentary on fitness. Do you want them to be someone who's never stepped, who's never ran? Is that, yeah. am I being accurate? Am I, am I also taking too much of the sunshine here? Because this is something I've looked into <laughs> based on, like, this, this is your idea before mine. No, so I just want to support what you're You're, you're right on it. Of. It's typically when a company comes into a new franchise and they, they buy up the rights to some, some IP. Let's say, ring, have, you know, Lord of the Rings appendices. But every single, every single franchise, what they have to do is they have to cater to two groups. They have to cater to the original fans because that's they're buying the IP because, hey, look, this IP has an already established group of fans that they're going to buy. They're going to pre-order our tickets. They're going to spread uh, through word of mouth. They're going to be free advertising to us. They're going to guarantee that we're going to make our box office numbers day one, the first weekend. That's the first group that they have to appeal to. Free and advertising. They are important. The, the original fans of an IP are very important to the company because that's how they make their money. Yes. But there is also a second group. They need to appeal to a new audience to bring in more people into this franchise to make it grow. I, I mean, they can't keep it. They can't uh, survive off just the original fans. They have to get it to grow so they improve the IP and get more money. That's what you have to do as a company. Now, if the company comes in and tries to service both groups it's a hard to, thing to balance but that's the best case scenario often though now i would say it happens more nowadays is companies are starting to forget or actually look down upon original fans and are only catering to a new audience and i think that is the people you need to gatekeep out you need to gatekeep those corporations or those people that would want to try to change something about the original thing that makes it that thing Exactly. And typically as a fan, and this has happened several times for me personally, is I'll be a fan of something. It starts going through a brand new change. You know, company buys it up. They start changing fundamental things about it. I'll be angry. I'll be upset about it. And then it goes into apathy. I don't care anymore. And no, and the, the French, that, that whole fandom is no longer what it used to be. And so I'm not a fan anymore. It's just kind of how it is. And that's a sad thing to happen, but in all honesty, it's about definitions. It's it's like either something is or it isn't. You're either a fan or you're not, and there's no there's no like negative connotation to that. The most extreme example I can think of is: Do you really think it was a fan decision in thinking of the original fans when Palpatine returned? Yeah, <laughs> like for for example, you know, I know J.J. Abrams was put in a hole because they didn't prep the th- the the movies for Star Wars, and it was a complete mess. And no, it makes no sense when you're making something that big, and that mm-hmm. big of a deal to have no plan. That baffles me still. But third movie, do you really think it was a? F- they thought of the original Star Wars, and they thought of the people that made the franchise what it is when returning Palpatine. Absolutely not. Yeah, no, that's I- definitely. <laughs> So there, yeah. there are certain decisions you look at and just go, hey, it's good to gatekeep. Like, hey, there's some things that 
fundamentally change the story that shouldn't happen. We should make sure that the people adapting our stuff have the fans at heart. Because there was... The reason there's a fandom in the first place is there's something about that IP that people like. Right. That needs to continue. Whether it changes or not, that's fine, but there's a nugget of something that makes it special. You shouldn't throw that away. Mm. And a better... I think a great example is... it. There was some leaked stuff from the writers of the Witcher TV show where they were actually outright mocking the original books and oh. actively disliked the games, actively disliked the books, and they were writing the TV show. No wonder the TV show turned out pretty poorly and got, and got worse and how Henry Cavill actually left it because it was being handled so poorly. It was Henry Cavill handled. was a big fan of the books too. Big fan of the... Uh, mainly big fan of the games but also yeah. fan of the books as well and he left because pe the people who were running it were not fans of the original thing so it was the witcher tv show is something else that that's ultimately what it is it just isn't the same and you shouldn't be treating it as the same and then to go off of that then if you cater to these new fans do those new fans even stick yeah, you're you're taking a risk. They may not. Th I would say newer fans are far more fickle. If there's a lot of surface level stuff that you can get a new fan in, so you, know, you get a flashy trailer and real great CGI, you'll get a lot of new people to come into something. But will they stick around? I would mm. say they probably don't. It's important here. Let's let's pull up what other booktubers are saying because again, the reason yeah. we're coming up with this video is that the general consensus is when you see a booktube video on gatekeeping, it's gatekeeping's bad. It's bad, it's bad, it's bad. Where we think this point is missing, and we'll expand on that again after reacting to these, but here's what booktubers, and we'll go Murphy first. Murphy's a huge booktuber, and please, Murphy, we mean no harm. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we could use the we could use the hate views. That, that wouldn't be bad. In thumbnail Murphy's face, she sucks! <laughs> Just, so I, I pulled up, here's a 30-second clip from her. I'm interested mm -hmm. in seeing what you think about it. Let's, let's go ahead and play. The gatekeeping I've seen has been uh, elitism. It looks something like this. I only read classics. That's real literature. Ew. Classics are outdated and boring. I read interesting YA books. <laughs> YA? That's for children. I read adult epic high fantasy. Oh, that's cute. You read fantasy? That's children's stuff. I read stuff that will actually enhance my life. I only read nonfiction. And they all suck. Ricky, you are 100% <laughs> that classical person. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, I have a lot of fun playing that up because yeah. a part of elitism is it's funny to me because I very much like what I like. Yeah, yeah. And I will take that to the extreme of elitism for fun. Like, sure. For example, Austin, uh, Justin, if you're watching. Wait, Austin, I, or, who are you talking to I right now? I confused you two, okay? You're, I confused my friends. First off, Justin's our roommate. I don't know if any audience member even knows that. You just looked at the camera and went, Justin, Look. and some random guy in the couch named Justin's going, what? Did he just break the fourth wall? Like, no. My buddy Justin, I am elitist toward him because mm. he reads Percy Jackson over and over again and tell him, read other things. He eventually did. It's good. But I'm elitist toward him because I think it's more funny. It, it's, sure, sure. But save that for your friends. Don't do that to random strangers. <laughs> but Murphy's talking about, though, I mean, it's you don't disagree with that, right? Of the, It is annoying. It's bad when people are just going, oh, my thing's better than yours. It It's annoying, but also I not just completely opposed to it it's more of wait, just, wait, go on that what it's fun a lot of this oh, stuff okay. of like oh i think my thing's better than your thing isn't that just life of like oh yeah i think fantasy is better than sci-fi i think this is like that's all it is ah. I, I don't want to get rid of that completely it, but there's so I to guess that point, if it's good natured, yes, but it seems like what she's honing in on is the people that are genuinely hateful toward it and just going, my thing's better than yours, yours thing shouldn't exist. Like, it's lower. Yeah. She's talking about the YA shouldn't be a, you can't like YA as an adult, which Justin, our roommate, you can't, but everybody else can. <laughs> Everyone else can, Justin. <laughs> make, make fun of your friends. some more other things. Yeah, make fun of your friends, but in general, like, I, I love YA still. Like, yeah, sure. Uh, but that, that kind of thing, are you differentiating from what she's saying? Yeah, it, it's mainly looking down on someone else for liking some, for liking another thing, 
shouldn't do that. It's, right. Unless it's good natured fun. But genuinely, the the thing I want to get far more specific is to her example. Someone saying that, oh, I only read classic fantasy. It'd mm-hmm. be someone else saying, like, going, oh, yeah, I read classic fantasy. I really love Brandon Sanderson. Ah. Brandon Sanderson's not classic fantasy, though. You're not a that's classic a, fantasy fan. Yes, that, right. that that's a matter of definitions. Like, cool, oh, okay. you like you like Sanderson. I like Sanderson. That's great. It's not classic. It's not classic. <laughs> it's too new for that. I also love YA. Exactly. I love, so- I love reading what's a not YA book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my, my mind went blank. <laughs> uh, the most recent thing you've read would probably be Fire Upon the Deep. Fire Upon the Deep. There you that go. That is not Thanks. YA. Thank you. <laughs> but it seems like Murphy's talking about a different kind of gatekeeping, which is yeah, why it's important. Looking down on others for yeah. liking something else. Yeah, don't do that. I, I I also don't think that's not the definition we're talking about, which is why it's we have to be very clear about what gatekeeping that we're talking about is. Because even this next clip, if you want to move mm-hmm. into this, everyone seems to be talking about a different form of it. Mm-hmm. And here's another booktuber, Brittany, who has still over 20k subscribers, smaller than Murphy. But I'm okay with going at war yeah, with a 20k subs. Send your send yeah. your hate views. Please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, here, here's uh, here's another clip, and this is what she says on gatekeeping prevent so that other people didn't have to feel not good enough is the gatekeeping that fans hold newer fans to these standards where you have to know every single thing about whatever it is the book or series that you're consuming i'm just keeping this to books today or you're not a true fan and you don't really get it once again it's like well you don't understand because you don't know every little detail. I hate that mindset so much because I'm so far from that type of fan. I want to enjoy and experience as many stories as possible throughout my life. Okay, pause there. It's funny because I say we're gonna be so hateful toward these clips, but I don't disagree with her again. It's a, <laughs> it's again, the, the reason we're making this video is the gatekeeping people are talking about. Of course, don't. Look, here, you go off of that. You jump off of what well, she's saying in particular is about looking down on people. is a conversation. It's not a checkbox of, oh, you don't know this, 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 this. You're not a fan. But it's a conversation. It's, it's something that you can't immediately find, but it'd be, if you're talking to someone and they say they're a fan of something, and then as you're going through this conversation, you find out they don't like most of the stuff about it, it more is it's just a question of why did you say you're a fan of this? What do you like about it? What do you not want to change? That's all it is. And it's those it. type of people that should be kept out of your fandom, mainly because they just don't meet the definition. It's the same thing of being like a Christian and like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe that Jesus is the son of God. Well, sorry to tell you, bud. <laughs> You're not a Christian. <laughs> That's just a matter of definition. Actually, I don't really believe in God at all. Wait, what? <laughs> That's all it is. <laughs> so uh, to, to Brittany's point here, this is, again, I keep, I want to emphasize this is that for some reason people are, it seems like there's a gap here in explaining why gatekeeping exists or the T- kind of, the typically kind of, that kind of negative gatekeeping comes mostly from ego. People right. want to want to feel superior to others they're a better the fan like she's exactly. she's talking about the the newer fans who know less and mm-hmm. looking down at them like oh you're not a fan like i am you're not this high of a fan which the gatekeeping again the, by this definition is no become a fan join mm-hmm. the community there's of course going to be levels of you know more you know less you're a new fan or an old fan or, or you've, you've been following it for a longer period of time it's not the amount of knowledge that you have it's just you share the common the common enjoyment of a story that connected you both. And that's why you're in this bubble. That's yeah. why you're in this fear because you guys find comfort in this. Yeah. I, I will say I've, I've gotten that feeling more specifically on songs and music is when there's some type of, there's some movie that comes out and they use a real popular, like a, they use a niche song and all of a sudden you start hearing this song everywhere and you go, Hey, why is one of my favorite songs being played all the time? Yeah. And it's because it was played in some movie or right, is now right. a new TikTok song. And you'll be like, and someone's playing, like, oh, yeah, I really love this song. I'm like, uh, Have you heard this song? It's great. And you're sitting there going, I've known about it for years because it's from this, not from your newfangled TikTok or movie thing. And there is a sense of ego there where you go. I knew it first. I knew it first. Yeah. It, it, like, 
the, who are there you is to a, say there's a sense of pride and we there's a sense of pride in being the i knew it first and i was i saw this before you you're it became too mainstream you have to be a bit edgy there's this <laughs> e, there's this narcissistic edginess to being it's not cool anymore once enough people know about it which number prime example is everything everywhere all at once seriously is i mm. love that movie when it came out I don't care that I was... I, I wasn't even one of the first ones to see. I saw a month after it came out. People were already loving the thing. But as it became more popular and eventually was talk in the Oscar circles and then eventually won the Oscars, I've noticed an online sentiment of the movies getting dogged on. It's not... like In the least circles I've seen on the internet, maybe it's because mm. my feed's different, everybody's is different, but the more popular this niche, really inventive, amazing movie became the more random hate was getting, like it's overrated. And uh, th- really, this is what everyone was talking about in the theaters, oh my God. Because then there's also the sense of pride on the other side of when something does become mainstream and people like it, now it's actually, it's it's like a clash. Did, did I say that correctly at all? Yeah, you no, see what th- I'm saying? There's, pl- there's plenty of people that want to be with the in-group and they like being a part of the big crowd and the mainstream and they get validation from that. And on the opposite side, other people get validation from being on the out group. Yeah. Like, oh, you all are just sheep. And they, they that's kind of the mentality of it. But thing is, people mm. get validation from both camps. And so yeah. this kind of elitist or ego, narcissistic mentality of you don't know enough about the fandom. And so, like, I'm a real fan that you're not. They take They get validation from being a part of a group and excluding others which is not what you should do yeah in general that's what, not what you, you should do. do is give all gatekeeping authority to richard and i we will exactly. determine if you are in the club or not that okay. that's exactly right hey look dictatorships are bad unless i'm the dictator unless it's the right person unless just gotta it's the right person find the right guy or exactly girl, you know just find the right person <laughs> you, you could find the right gal or girl guy or girl but ultimately there is no girl because the right guy is me Oh, right. It exactly. comes back to you. Exactly. Course, it comes back to me. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I can't... We're doing... We saved the best for last. Oh, yeah. We're now going for Daniel Green's neck. As, as you could tell by the two prior reactions we had, we really went for them. We went for the jugular. Oh, yeah. Murphy and Brittany are shivering at how strongly we attacked them. So we're going to be just as mild about Daniel Green. Here's his clip on gatekeeping. But let me just get my main message of this video out there. It does not matter what level of a fan you are for something. You can be a fan of it, and no one can tell you not to. If someone has only listened to the audiobooks of a fantasy series and never physically read them, they can be just as big a fan and have every right to talk about the books as anyone else who has read them physically, through photosynthesis, I don't All care. All right, so, father there. So, so his message being doesn't matter what state, you know, you, you can call yourself a fan. No one can stop you from calling this. You listen to it, read it. What do you think about that? Ultimately, yeah, you can say whatever you like. No one can stop you from saying anything. But also on the flip side, other people could say other things about you as well. Everyone's free to say things. I, I mean, if you say like, oh, yeah, I've read three books out of 14. I'm a fan. Uh, are you? You're referring to real time or yet. something over there? <laughs> not yet. You're a fan of those three books. <laughs> Give it like you do. There are certain definitions to being a fan of something. You have to have consumed the material to a certain degree. Maybe if it's a long TV show, maybe not everything. You have to probably like it. You like at least most of it. If you don't like it, you don't like it, you're not a fan. That's all it is. It, people can talk about that. This loops back into the arbitrariness of it, though. It is. I know it's arbitrary, Just but... The, there's no line for... So if I was Basically, to, the extremes are wrong. Got it. That's, that's all it is. It's the, hey, no one's a fan unless they've read everything, watched every comment, and read all the Wikipedia pages and know all the details. No. But also the other side is, hey... You can say your fan no matter what, even if you dislike everything and want everything to change. And, oh, actually, you haven't even con- read the books or you haven't even s- consumed the stuff that you're even talking about. No, you're not a fan. Or there's two extremes to that. I would say Daniel falls on like the more extreme of you could say whatever you want. Like everyone's a fan no matter what opinions That's they have. That's what you disagree with. I would disagree with that. Got it. Is, 
there is a definition to being a fan. I think what I that definition is, that's where the debate comes in. That's why it's not set in stone. Now, in his fairness, he was talking more about if you listen to the books or read the books, you could still call yourself a fan. But then he adds, I don't care if you digested the flute photosynthesis. It seems like it's a joke. Yeah, it's, yeah, of course. It seems like he's saying if you actually read the books and like them, you're a fan. But you know, talk. But missing out, it seems like what all these videos and you can, you guys can watch all the videos in the description. We'll we'll link to all of them. Where the extended conversation is always talking about letting people in, which yes, but it's never talking about why the gate's there. Yeah, because there's a there's a reason there's a gate. There's a reason you call yourself a certain religion. There's a reason you call yourself a fan of something. That's okay if you're not a fan. And the gate is supposed to open up, yes. but it's also supposed to close sometimes. Like when you go to heaven, it's going to be damn shut. <laughs> like you're not you're not stepping a foot. You, so it's one of those clouds. You step right at, falling, falling down the earth and then past earth, then to hell. Oh, I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, nothing to say. I'm trying. You just made me feel bad. Because just... it's true. I oh. don't go to church. <laughs> I thought you. I thought you were gonna have something mean to like fight back and say, but you just now I pity you. <laughs> I'm just saying. Hey, if you ever somehow make it to the pearly gates, one, I'll know how you got there because I sent you there myself, and I'm dragging you down <laughs> with me. Rishi, I'm I'm gonna be hip to hip with you. Don't worry. Oh yeah. If I'm going, you're definitely going. God's like, so what were you saying about Hyperion? So what'd you say about that, Austin? I'm like, uh, <laughs> now I think we have one of the best examples, though. Oh, on what? what? Who like, definitely isn't a fan? Of what? And let's just go right into the clip. I'm gonna show you. I think this is the best example of when we're saying oh, yeah. you're not a fan. Yeah. It's this. More. So the fact that we're going to be seeing things that are potentially going to make us love the Hobbit films and the Lord of the Rings films and potentially the books as well. Potentially the books huh? as well. I keep watching. Maybe the books. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? They're already perfect. Well, there needs to be a reason for the rings uh, being made, right? So obviously with the wars this. happening and then like, oh. So what was the reason? <laughs> <laughs> For within these rings was bound the strength and will to govern each race. <laughs> but they were all of them deceived. For another ring was made. And then uh, you it's know the rest. You know the rest of the story. Yeah. It's yeah. literally the opening. <laughs> no, no, like now. So to be fair, like this was actors. An yeah, this was an infamous situation where these are three or four Gen Zers were brought to advertise to get all the new young kids to watch Rings of Power. And they were flame because they were clearly not fans. Yeah, they're they're paid actors. It's, yeah, it's all like I'm honestly not even. It's not even their fault. They were brought. It's a they're probably it's paid acting, money. It's and, an acting job. Yeah. Hey, here's your lines. Say this. It's Amazon's fault at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, no, it's Amazon. I, it's, I don't blame them. I blame Amazon. <laughs> they're the ones at fault. I, I would totally fake being a fan of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like they just haven't seen it, and it's fine. It's okay. You don't have to watch Lord of the Rings. If it's not your thing, it's not your thing. No. But it just means you're not a fan. That 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 is a pretty infamous clip of it, no. it's not like they're chained it's not like they wrote Rings of Power. Yeah. And I did say we'd bring this up later. A little bit of Rings of Power stuff. Do you <laughs> think that true fans made Rings of Power? I bet there's some true fans in there. Yeah. I bet there's some people in there that really did like it. But ultimately, when you're in that type of corporate machine, you kind of have to do your job, do what you're told. And the people running it, it's, I mean, making a TV show like that and how expensive it is, I know it must be hard because you do have to change some things to adapt. And even thinking about adapting the Silmarillion must be really hard. Like, it would be a difficult thing to do. They weren't even adapting the Silmarillion. I know, they were yeah. adapting the appendices, but... Second age material, yeah. I imagine, can be very difficult. Oh, it's not sure. standard storytelling, so it's a hard job. However, I'd understand changing things that maybe have to be, but there's other actual decisions where you go, you didn't have to change that. This didn't have to be changed, and yet you did it anyway. Why'd you do that? And mm. typically it's because they probably don't really like the material that they are adapting. Or they don't care, they want... they. They like their new thing more than they like the old thing. Maybe they do like Lord of the Rings, but they think, hey, I can do it better. 
or I like my version of it better than the old one. Ultimately, they're more of a fan of their own than what they came before. Something you touched on earlier of the new fans being more fickle. So as a corporation, and this is where the mm-hmm. gatekeeping comes in mind, if you want to make sure your adaptations and your fandom stay true to what makes your IP great and you don't want it to stray too far, because then it becomes a different thing. So when it comes to the newer fickle fans that a corporation is trying to please because they're trying to broaden the audience and get mass market appeal versus the original fans, it seems to be the case that if a director, an auteur, an author come in with the... Did you notice how I used the word auteur? I, oh, I noticed. You, what did I you noticed about, I was going to... I was going to ignore it, you, but what'd now you think, brought it up. What would you think about that that word? You're not a real... <laughs> you're not a real <laughs> fan. You're not a real reader. <laughs> uh, I'm so upset I used that word. I'm real... Like, I regretted it. I was like, oh, Richie's going to... He's going to completely crap oh, I, I was going to save that for after recording and just I know. Know, beat it into oh, you but it was not good okay anyways you chose to bring it up I, I was going to skip it I, know. I was going to let the comments I, handle yeah, that yeah, but okay whatever but, so an auteur right so uh-huh. you have you. let's say for example the best example of this is Lord of the Rings the, the movies of course with Peter Jackson mm-hmm. of when you have someone who truly loves the source material like, like Peter Jackson and you have actors such as oh Christopher Lee Christopher Lee, who plays Sauron, and is met Tolkien in real life, read the books, has been a fan, reads them every year up until his uh, he died in twenty fifteen tragically. But mm-hmm. he fantastic actor. You have these people that love it, and that exudes, and it shows that they stay true to the source material as close as they possibly can. Of course, it's an adaptation, but and, the, be, the and love, fans can disagree yes, with some changes. Sure. And like, but that's the, perfectly that, fine. that love translates through, and it comes from a genuine place of they love doing it. Yeah. So if you go in pleasing the original fans, look what happened in Lord of the Rings. The movies brought an entire scope of new fans. I would not have known probably about Lord of the Rings because my dad showed me the movies when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. The movies. My dad was a fan, hadn't read Lord of the Rings until the movies. Meaning I probably wouldn't have read the books in the first place if it wasn't for the movies. They, they right. brought a whole span of new fans to this IP because they were so true to the original. And by staying true to the original fans, they extended and got all these new fans who also loved it. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you go in with the intent of let's change it up and mass appeal to these new fans, you end up with neither the new fans or the old fans because the new fans will leave because they're fickle and they they just were introduced to this. They don't have the heart behind it while the original fans who love this now see it destroyed and aren't fans of the new thing. So you end up with no fans. <laughs> Typically, it is a, it, it's a truth in marketing, in storytelling, in anything that you need to actually focus whatever if you're trying to get someone's attention if you're trying to make something good you do have to exclude trying to have too diverse of a story and diverse not meaning skin color but diverse as in trying to appeal to too many groups and trying to make it so broad you please nobody and this is actually a really good example with stand-up comedians oh go on that stand-up comedians will actually when they go to a new town they will have some little jokes and they will actually reference the state that they're from yes and they will actually try and make more niche jokes for the local area and that often gets a lot of appeal a lot of people like oh hey that's my state and they feel part of in that moment in that auditorium in that theater whatever in that room they're part of a group and they feel in and versus if you try and tell like a Boston related joke in England it doesn't work and so if you're trying to do as a comedian try and tell jokes that appeals to every single nation every single type of group of people you're not going to get really good laughs the best laughs are going to come from ones that are just targeted that really yeah narrow down to a group and it's the same thing with a kind of television show or a movie or story Sci-fi is typically not known for its romance. Just typically not what... Those two do not overlap often. Meld. They don't meld, right? Not very often. (laughs) Let's say you're trying to... You're trying to get... There's two different groups of people. There's people that like sci-fi and there's people that like romance novels. Okay. Sometimes those are the same people. They overlap. But often those are two types of groups. If you're making a story and you're trying to appeal to both of them, you'll often get less of both. Versus if you just try and appeal to the sci-fi group, try to appeal just to the romance group, you'll have a lot better time. Versus trying to please both groups, you'll please neither. 
That is generally true. And maybe mm-hmm. there's the magical scenario where they, you get it just right, but it's much harder. Definitely. It's way harder. And the, the comedy club analogy is great. Mm-hmm. That that works so well because you, you want to appeal to that group, except the uh, in England, I think you can make like a Boston Tea Party joke. That would, that would probably work. I guess that's so, the joke you could do. You oh, could do that one. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. But to your point, it makes so much sense because why, why make a niche Boston joke in San Fran? Yeah. And the solution is not to make a so broad of a joke that everyone gets it. It's to just focus your market. So I would say a really great example of when it was done well, I was a, I was a big fan of Doctor Who. And so Doctor Who um, original run uh, from the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and all the way up to the movie in the 80s, early 80s there, that was the original run. My, my mother was a big fan of Doctor Who, the, the original run. Then in 2003. Three. Thank you. I have no idea. I just, I, I finally got you. You always do that to me. Do. I finally got you. you got if this me. is your first time on the channel, Richie always pulls things out of his ass and makes me believe them. And uh, for the first time on camera, I bamboozled you. I have no idea what I the was date thinking is. 2009. And I think you got me. Yes. Yes. 2003 sounds right. Anyway. <laughs> Point being, wait, I swear if it actually was okay. What if it was actually 2003 and I gave you the right date? I would be surprised. Oh, 2005. 2005. (laughs) I was some, it's somewhere there. Anyway, okay, go on. The new run of Doctor 2005 had to do the job of gathering both the previous original audience, the people who liked the original Doctor Who, and then also garnering this new group of fans. It did great, it appealed to both. Now, I will say that some people, like, there is a little hiccup, you know, like. Some newer fans are going like, hey, this is a little weird. Okay. And where do they lean? It, did Doctor Who lean toward appeasing the new fans or pleasing the old fans? I think it did a good job at getting both. Maybe leans more toward the new fans. But, but not egregiously so. Not egregiously so. A plenty of people who were fans of the old Doctor Who were fans of the new Doctor Who going into it. Okay. Not perfect, but definitely did pretty darn well. Had plenty of references, and it felt like... A updated version of their old show. Right. Then, uh, after Peter Capaldi's run the, of the Doctor, there was a brand new uh, showrunner, Chris Chibnall, and they did a brand new uh, series with a the Doctor's now a female. And not only that, that's honestly one of the smallest changes. I would say to just the nature of their storytelling and their writing changed so much about the show fundamentally and the show's history and retconned a bunch of stuff to the Ooh. point where it's a new thing. It's just different. It is just different. I didn't think it was very really good. And at first I was kind of upset. And then to a point I just became apathetic. And that all of... They gained some new fans, but a lot of old fans just dropped it. Didn't the viewership numbers collapse? Oh, yeah. No, an Antiques <clears throat> Roadshow beat out their season finale. Oh, and to be fair, Antiques Roadshow slaps. Antiques Roadshow's pretty great. That's a pretty good show. It's pretty good. <laughs> but at one point, Doctor Who was so great that they had Christmas specials, and their Christmas uh, specials were just so huge. Yeah. So important to so many people, and now there's like, it's not even big enough to even justify a Christmas special. Who cares? Oh, man. It, it's gone so downhill because the main reason is they were focusing toward a new audience and not trying to please the old ones. And even now, they've... On the surface, they may be trying to. They're, brought in, they're bringing back my favorite doctor with uh, David Tennant, bringing back uh, um, the original showrunner behind it, and I just don't care anymore. They've killed Damn. it to the point of apathy for me. Mm. And so no matter what they do, they're not getting me as an old fan back. But this has happened to a lot of different fandoms that I personally like. Star Trek, they went through it. Um, Star Wars? Star Wars, yeah. It's... To the point of apathy. I've never been the biggest fan, but I was. I was a fan of it. I loved Clone Wars. So, yeah. I think that's about it. (laughs) So, it would be fair to say this. As the gatekeeping that you think is okay. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm pretty much on board with you Mm -hmm. to this thing. Like, as we've been talking this out, yeah, it's, it's a vital thing that 
booktubers have been missing why it's good. So obviously it's bad in the regard of you shouldn't wall people out, like not welcoming people into your thing. Don't have pride and ego about being, oh, it's my thing and not yours, clearly. And it's in your benefit to talk more. You want more people to talk about your books with. I mean, that's that's why I read is because you read stuff and were like, hey, I need to force one of my friends to talk about things with me. Yeah. That's pretty much why I'm here. So <laughs> that's the whole thing is let people in. But there is a if someone calls themselves a fan and they fundamentally want to change what the thing is, that's where it crosses the line because then it ruins what the thing you love is. And eventually, if you don't gatekeep your community well, one... It's not a community at all You're eventually going to get gatekeeped out yourself. Mm. The new fans are going to take over and go, oh, well, you're a bigot for thinking this, or oh, you're not a real fan because it's now this way. And then eventually you're out of your own fandom. (laughs) So those are the people you need to keep out. There's this Forbes article I'll put right here, and the title of it is, Fans Aren't Gatekeeping Anything. They're Just Wary of Would-Be Dictators Trying to Take Over Their Hobbies. That's, yeah, that's exactly that's, how I feel on most most of it. Yeah, and, and that's this article saying there's a great deal of pushback from fans. Not They don't want to stop people watching what they like or reading what they like. They don't want their fandom, their hobby to descend in some kind of dictatorship by someone who doesn't care about what they care about. Yeah. You know what, Rich? I'm on board with you. There we Good go. stuff. I'm glad we agree. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh, is it, isn't that rare on a Tudor Ramble episode? Just <laughs> us going back and forth bumbling about things we slightly disagree <laughs> with or whatnot so but let us know down in the comments uh, what you guys think and has this ever happened to a fandom of yours that you can that you can recall and if so which fandom was it let yeah. us know and we'll talk to you guys later talk to you guys later and definitely check our patreon in the description below as well we have a book club where we read books watch movies with people monthly as well thank you guys for the support this was a fun video we will see you next week bye bye y'all